as the man who taught Hal Abelson everything he knows about C sharp. <laughs> Um, I actually, uh, and the reason Craig is here today, I made him do this talk. We were both working on this project, and I said, you've got to present this, and he was, he was very humble. He wasn't going to do it. Uh, and then I revealed that I had compromising photos of him with Stu Halloway. Uh, and, uh, I threatened that if he didn't, didn't uh, do this talk at Closure Conj, that I would send them to Neil Ford. So, uh, here he is, Craig Andera, to talk about closure performance. And, and 
it's worse, right? Because your application probably doesn't do one thing, right? You're not building a home page, presumably, that does nothing but just you know, display the home page. It does a bunch of stuff in different combinations, right? The world is not deterministic either. I mean, Rich likes to talk about, you know, observations of the world. What is the world like? The world is not deterministic. It's stochastic. Stochastic means involving randomness. There's all sorts of things that can happen. And we need to characterize, in my opinion, we need to characterize the system um, in a, in, with a stochastic mindset, right? We need to have a stochastic model of the system's performance. <clears throat> so models, right? Like I said, you have a model for your system even if you do it haphazardly. Your model is right, that it's always this way, and I don't, I don't think that's right. What we really are looking for is a more useful model, right? So we can answer questions. Useful to me means, can I answer questions about the system? If I have a model that tells me what the system's gonna do, 99% um, of the time, there's that stochastic bit, right? 99% of the time, when I've got 10 users that are doing this or that or whatever, right? I have a model that describes that, that's useful. I can answer questions with that. I can decide, make decisions about how to build the system with that. What will it do if I can mention on Hacker News and suddenly there's 10,000 users? That may be something that's really useful to you to know. Okay? If a model that can explain that, you can make use of that. You know, capacity planning, there's all sorts of things you can do if you have a model. Okay? If your model is just, the system always returns the home page in three seconds or whatever, you know, three years, three months, that's not really useful. So we want to build these models. We want to have a model for our system or a family of models. Um, that allows us to answer questions. The thing is, this model is assuredly wrong. Okay, why? Um, because it's not the real world, right? What's your system gonna do in the real world? Well, you're gonna test it, right? You're gonna build a model, you're gonna do that by well and testing, at least if you build the sort of systems that I do. And it's gonna tell you how the system behaves at various loads, right? Stochastically, we get a, a function that will explain to us what the distribution of response times will look like. But that's not really the same thing as saying, here's what the system will do in the real world. There's all sorts of reasons that could be, right? But they come out of your assumptions, right? Things like, you know, you're testing your test environment because production's off limits, right? You can't, can't, we can't have the production environment. That's common. Small versus large data, right? Maybe your system, you've tested, it's got 10,000 rows in the database, but after a year in use, you've got 10 million rows in data, and performance of the system is limited by database performance, which is dominated by, you know, how you index, whatever. So, you know, these are the other things. Are you load balanced? I was working, the system that I worked on with Stuart, Sierra, um, we were unable to test the system in a load balanced environment. There were a number of reasons for that, most of them weren't technical. So we had to say, well, we assume that the load balance performance of the system will be different. That was an assumption, right? So our model was wrong. <laughs> it was not gonna tell us the, fun, the, the performance of the, of the real world system. The thing is, is that's not an excuse for not doing this, right? I mean. The, the quote that I love is, it's not about whether the model is right or not, right? All models are wrong. The question is how wrong you have to be before it's still useful. And I really like this because I, I, it comes back again to, can I answer questions? Is this is it useful, right? And I think it's really very possible to build a model in your system that has all the problems we talked about. But is this still useful for answering questions? Is it still useful to decide, should I make this up next optimization or not? How many servers do I need? There's always fudge factors, right? But I think it's, it's still um, important to remember um, that wrong, even wrong models can be useful. Um, the other thing that you need to do here is, is to make sure that when you're going through this process and building your model, that you are explicit and deliberate and, and careful about identifying your assumptions. Hey customer, we think the system will perform like this because we measured it in this environment. That differs from the production environment in the following ways. Okay, you can make decisions with that. So, the, the, I, like I said, there's a model that I use, it's really a family of models, it's a model generation um, uh, technique um, that I like to use when I'm building transactional web systems. I like to make sure that I think about the system as, when I'm characterizing the system, I want to characterize, uh, characterize it as, what is the distribution of latencies, or response times, however you want to say that. What is the distribution of latencies at a given load, right? When the system is processing this many requests per second, what is the distribution of latencies? 90% of them come back in this amount of time. 95% of them come back in this amount of time, et cetera, et cetera. What's the distribution of, 
of, of, of the response times. At a given throughput, for a given transaction mix, that's super important, right? It's really easy to walk up to a system and measure it doing one thing, maybe reads, and never throw writes in there. But there's, you know, or, or whatever, right? Your system has 17 pages and you just hit one of them, right? You want to be thinking about all these things, right? You want to be thinking, what is the distribution of response times at, at a, you know, across throughputs for a given transaction mix or mixes, right? Whatever is important to you, plus whatever other constraints you have. This could be anything, right? We had a system where, um, and I'll talk about it later, the, the limits were that, you know, 99% of the responses had to come back in 10 milliseconds or less um, at such and such a load, and the responses which were coming out of the back end system had to be no older than five minutes, right? Why is that important? Because it controls how we can do caching. We couldn't cache for you know, a longer than five minutes, right? So, so these, these are the things that you need to identify, right? But I think that the fundamental features here are what is the distribution of latency at, uh, for a, a set of throughputs is a really, really useful default case to make, right? And the way you get this is um, uh, by load testing. So we've all probably done load testing, and you probably have generated a graph that looks like this. Right? So I drive the system with you know, one simulated user, then I drive it with two users, then I drive it with three users. And I see what the throughput looks like. How many, you know, how many requests can I bang through the system? For some transaction mix, right? 90% reads, 10% writes, whatever that means to you. Right? <clears throat> and you get a graph that looks like this. Okay? A couple things to note here. Um, first of all, um, that's bumpy. This is real world data that I pulled from a test that I did way back uh, a bunch of years ago. And uh, one of the things that I've observed is you have to get used to this, right? Like we were never able to explain why throughput went down and then back up again when we loaded the system up more. No, 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 right? This is just the way it was. But the other thing is that this is not a stochastic model. What are we missing? Distribution of latencies, right? Like I don't know, you know, what the response time is. Yeah, I'm servicing 180 requests per second. How long do they take, right? In a transactional system that matters, I don't think any of your customers care that you're serving uh, a million users if they have to wait 30 seconds, right? These things are typically important um, in transactional systems. Um, so what you really want is, a, is, is this, right? This is what you're after. And again, this is some weirdness here on the right, on the, uh, the right there. Um, you, that's the distribution of latencies. Notice that the system is actually much slower at low load. Never figured that one out either. <laughs> Sorry, right? We didn't care about that regime, so it didn't matter that much. But the important thing here is, I can look at the system, and now, um, if I have this, this is my model, right? For some transaction mix, this is my model. I can answer all sorts of interesting questions, right? Can we meet customer expectations? Well, I've got 10 users. Each one is hitting the system, whatever, once a second, make the math easy. Okay, my throughput is 10 requests per second. I need them to be um, served in less than two seconds, 99% of the time. I can answer that question with this model. It's not the real world, right? We have some assumptions, but it's still useful, right? So this is, again, I mean, I keep hitting on this, but it's, I think it's, it's super important, and it's something I've seen even senior engineers get wrong. The distribution of latencies for a, at a, at a, at a, characterized by load for a given transaction, it's, it's, it's really it's super useful to look at the system that way. Um, like I said, there's other questions you can answer as well. Um, so, so you've developed your model, right? And it turns out it doesn't meet your requirements. You know, it's obvious. Oh, geez, well, even in the best case, you know, um, our requests are coming back way too slow. What should we do about it? Um, I, I like to think that there's a, a pretty um, easy set of steps you can follow. Well, the, a, a small, there, there's a set of steps. They're not always easy to do. Uh, easy, simple, whatever. Um, <laughs> I was speaking in the vernacular. Um, so there's a set of steps you can follow, and I call it the optimization loop. You benchmark the system, okay, to give you an idea of what your what your model currently is, right? This is us measuring what's the distribution of response times at a given uh, throughput or you know across throughputs um, for a given transaction mix. Great. Where are we at? And maybe the answer is you're done. Great. But probably not. So analyze the system. Figure out what you need to figure out what the thing, what's preventing you from meeting your goals. Make a recommendation on what to do about it. 
Recommendation might be do nothing. And then make an optimization, repeat the loop. You know, rinse and repeat. Okay. So let's take a look at each of these individually. So benchmarking. Like I said, this is where you're going to do your load test. Right? You're going to drive a system at low load, medium load, high load, get your curves, get your distributions. Okay. Um, there's a bunch of things you can do, a bunch of things you should do, and a bunch of things you shouldn't do. Um, you definitely want to measure the parameters of your model, right? And what I mean is, just don't forget you're trying to get the distribution. You need, you need to make sure that you drive your load test in such a way that you can actually get that data so you can build your model. Um, remember transaction mix, we've been on that enough. Understand what you're measuring. Okay. This comes back to that, what are the assumptions in my model, right? If your model is wrong, why is it wrong? What are your assumptions? Um, you may say, um, I, am, I am measuring um, user experience response time. The, the, the moment from where the user hits, you know, clicks the button until the moment where the home page finishes rendering. But if your load test is uh, being instrumented by uh, doing timing where the request hits the web server, you're not really measuring that, right? You're measuring response time inside the server. Okay? And that's fine, right? Again, you have to make assumptions with this model. But you need to remember that. You need to, you need to understand what are you measuring? What is the thing you are actually measuring? And either change your test or update your assumptions or modify your model. Do whatever it is you need to do in order to get the answers you need, you need to. Sorry, I can't give you more specific advice there, but these, you know, it just depends on the project. I've seen this change um, radically depending on the political realities of the project or the technical constraints. Um, what are some things you can forget? Um, don't mistake number of threads for load. Uh, I've seen this happen too. It's very easy, you know, if you use a tool like JMeter, which is one that I've used uh, to great effect to generate uh, load, uh, load tests. Um, you know, the parameter, the knob you can turn in JMeter, the easiest knob to turn is how many threads you're running. One thread, two threads, three threads, they're each turning away as fast as they can. It's not really the same thing. It's certainly not the same thing as the real thing you're trying to characterize, which is, you know, for a given load, what does response time look like? It's definitely not number of users, um, and, it, and it's certainly not any kind of metric other than here's what I put in the JMeter. I just mention that because I have seen people do this over and over again. They draw the graph, they say, here's what we got, and we, the graph that we have, the throughput graph. At the bottom it says one, two, three, four, five threads. It's completely useless. Just erase that axis from your, you're not helping anybody. You will confuse your customers. They will think that's the number of users. Right, your developers will think that's the number of users or something else completely. Don't get those things confused. It seems like an odd thing to mention, but I've seen them enough that I, that I left it in. Um, don't forget to look for errors. This happened to us. We were measuring the system. Um, the system, uh, the, the numbers that came back were a little strange. We, we, we said, that's a little bit weird. Let's look into it. It, it turned out that um, all of the requests that came back were errors. <laughs> there was some misconfiguration, and we were measuring, what were we measuring? We were measuring how long it took to render an error page. Right? Not particularly useful. But, but it's important, right? When you, when you produce this report, when you're looking, when you're, whatever you drive out of your load test here, um, you want to say, okay, um, I got this throughput, this was the distributions of latencies, and here's how many errors there were. Okay? And if that's not part of your transaction mix, if you're not defining that some of those Request should result in errors. That number better be zero, right? So update your report to render that in giant red letters or whatever. Um, is my mic cutting out? I can't really hear. A little bit. Raise up a bit. I'm gonna. I'll try that for a second. If that doesn't work, I'll go to the old Craig boosted audio. Is that better? Okay. You can hear me back. All right, great. Um, don't keep going if you're done. It's a waste of time. That's one of the things the loop helps you with, right? Remember the. The, uh, there's a big red arrow right there. If you're done, stop. Stop optimizing. You can continue to measure um, your performance. Okay. <laughs> if I talk like this, anybody in the back that can't hear me? Great. <laughs> All right, so, yeah. Don't keep going if you're done. And don't wait to start. Right? You can do this early in your project. I'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about um, optimization. Um, I mentioned tools briefly. We've used JMeter. On other projects, we've used AB, HTTP perf. There's tons of stuff out there. Again, what you're after is be able to drive the system 
at different loads and be able to capture the distribution of latencies. If you can do those two things, it doesn't really matter what you use. Right? Um, as far as uh, analysis, that's in the wrong spot. We'll talk about that in a minute. Oh, I'm, not, I'm sorry. That is actually in the right, right spot. The analysis of the load results, um, you can use whatever you want to. I've seen people use Excel, but we've got this great tool for analyzing reams of uh, data. It's called Clojure. You might have heard of it. I hear they have a conference. Um, yeah, we use this on our project. In fact, Luke Vanderhart, um, uh, Stuart Sierra's co-author, another colleague of ours at Relevance, um, wrote a plug-in to JMeter um, that lets you actually visualize the results right in JMeter. Pretty cool. JMeter's written in Java. It, it, Clojure integrates well with that. So um, I'm not sure where that stuff is. Do you know if he has that online or not, Stuart? I don't think so. Okay, so we'll bug him to get that out there. But um, really, if you can produce a chart, that's all you need. right? Okay, so you've done your benchmarking. You're not done. Okay. Now you do some analysis. There's something that's preventing my system from being faster. What is it? Well, let's analyze it to find out. So we want to find the single biggest factor in the performance of your system, ideally. Okay. And we want to do it empirically. Don't guess. I've seen senior engineers do this too. Oh, it's got to be because we're using an insertion sort, right? That's got to be it. No, measure it. How do you do that? Profile it. Uh, I didn't put it on the slide, but we've used your kit. Works great with Clojure. Really nice tool. Highly recommend it. Now, notice that you, you don't actually have to, um, when you're doing the analysis, you don't necessarily have to drive your system uh, the same way that you do during your load test. It's not always important that your system be processing its peak capacity, because oftentimes what you care about, and in transactional systems, it, it is common, especially in early rounds, that it's, it's simply easier to analyze uh, a single request for the system or you know, a small number of requests for the system and one thing is dominating your performance so much that it doesn't matter. But as you go on and uh, you make more and more sophisticated optimizations, you may discover that it actually is important to run your system at load. But generally in early rounds, I haven't bothered to do that. The other important part of analysis is lots of hard thinking especially in the later rounds. It can be tricky, right? K typical case is one thing dominates 80%. You take that out, oh, now there's one thing that's 60%. You take that one out, well, eventually you're at the point where there's uh, 40 or 50 things that all take 2% of your time. That's hard. You're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to think hard about what your system is doing in order to figure out what the one thing is that's limiting you. And again, be aware of transaction mix, right? I said that you can simplify, you don't necessarily have to run your system at peak load in order to do this sort of analysis, but you do very much want to make sure that you are representing all the different operations that your system does, right, in a balanced way. Or maybe you have to say, okay, we're going to analyze the read path, we're going to analyze the write path. Look at those things. Figure out where you need to spend your time, okay? Again, no generic advice here. This is the hard work. All right, so you've, identif you've identified the, uh, the thing that's dominating your performance. The next step is make a recommendation. All right, again, this is usually pretty easy at first. I'll give you a hint. It's the database. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, actually. That's, that's not right, right? We, we want to be empirical. That's another mistake people make. Oh, it's got to be the database. And it often is, but you have to measure, okay? Use the data. You've just done this profile. You've got load tests. You've got data. Make use of it. Look at it. See what it tells you. The best recommendation you can make is, we're done. Now that could be for a couple reasons. One is, uh, you've hit your target, right? In that case, you probably stopped at the benchmarking phase. The other one is, it's too expensive to continue, right? The customer has changed their mind. We told them it would take another five weeks to do this, to get whatever we think is going to happen, you know, whatever we think is going to uh, make the system better. Five weeks for another 5%, no thanks, we'll rewrite our SLA, service level agreement. We'll just rewrite it, okay? Whatever your recommendation is, it's, assuming it's not, let's stop. The next, the next thing you wanna do is optimize, right? Fix the one slowest thing, scientific method, right? Don't change 95 variables at the same time. Change one thing. This loop is intended to be pretty tight, right? You can get through it pretty quick. Here's the kicker. 
you might find out that redesign is necessary. There is no guarantee that you will find something where it's like, if I just replace this algorithm, if I just cache this, the system will suddenly get 10 times faster. Sorry, you might need to switch databases. You might need to do something truly horrible, like write, rewrite the system in C, right? This is why you want to start early. There's a great quote that I love. Um, that's actually a pair of quotes, right? You've probably seen some of this or some variation. I'll paraphrase. Um, you know, any problem in computer science can be solved by adding a layer of indirection. Any problem in performance engineering can be solved by removing a layer of indirection. It's funny, but it's true. Um, you know, and what does that mean? I mean, if that layer of indirection is something like your virtual machine, <laughs> you might have to redesign. You want to start early. Now, you don't need to, if starting early, to, you could start at the beginning of the project when you've got a completely, you know, you just, you've generated your framework, right? It doesn't do anything yet. You don't necessarily have to start on day one. Um, but I think there's value in starting well ahead of actually being done with the project. And it's this, uh, your, your, your customer, your stakeholder may not yet have identified where they need to be, but there is value in knowing whether the change that you made just now affected the system in a relative way, right? My performance is that 99% of the requests will come back in less than 10 milliseconds when the system is loaded up to uh, 500 requests per second. Am I done or not? No idea. Customer won't tell me. But I know that's twice as slow as yesterday. I did something, right? That's important information. So I think there's real value in starting early even when you don't have requirements. So I want to talk to you now about how we were able to apply this. We, um, we, as I say, Relevance, we're working with a customer on a, uh, a web service um, written in almost pure closure, and I'll get into the almost in a second. Um, it was an a intrusion detection system. Uh, like I said, web service, so you know, someone make a request, we'd make a JSON response. It was actually almost an ideal case, because it actually did only do one thing. So for us, transaction mix was simple. Tons and tons of this one type of request, right? Um, in terms of where we started, uh, now I realize that these are not stated stochastically, right? <coughs> we didn't start in a good place. Part of the reason I'm here talking to you is because some of the things we discovered were that this was a terrible metric for where we were. We started out about 75 requests per second peak. The most you could jam through the system before performance started to degrade was 75 requests per second. Before throughput started to degrade, was 75 requests per second. At about 25 milliseconds average latency. That's average. What an awful measure, right? <laughs> average. So half your users are doing worse than that. Who cares, right? So already we, already we know we could do better than this, in, just in terms of characterizing the system. So what did we do? Well, the biggest thing we did, I think, was to prepare the customer. We actually sat down with them and said, OK, here is how you need to think about the system. You need to be thinking about, <laughs> guess what? Right? What is the distribution? I don't even know if I need to finish that. Right? What's the distribution of latencies you know, at, at some throughput this percentage of the time? And, and we got that, right? which was great, because that's something we could actually work to. In, in terms of applying the optimization loop, um, once we got buy-in, um, uh, to, to do the work and uh, got the customer to identify where they wanted to be in those stochastic terms. We got them into that stochastic mindset. We took a two card approach, right? We used story cards. We would generate one card which was a combination of benchmarking and analysis and recommendation. So we would run our load test and also do uh, profiling and then out of that we would generate a recommendation. The recommendation was actually another story card. So we had card, one card, the output of that card was another card which was um, the optimization we wanted to do, right? And then the output of that card was um, the work and also another benchmarking card, right? And this worked really well for us because it kept the customer involved. We were able to do these, I forget exactly, but we were able to do a, bunch, you know, a few rounds, uh, one or two a week. And at every point, we'd generate this card, customer would say, oh, I see, what, I see where the system is at now. Oh, I understand your recommendation. Yes, let's do that optimization. 
We would do the optimization. They'd say, yep, optimization work is done. I think it makes sense to benchmark again. It worked really well for us. It kept them involved. And it made a record in the project history of um, what we had done. Right? That was useful, too. Um, we spent a month, maybe a little bit more, on this. Yeah. So uh, we start, here's, where do we start? Remember, 75 requests per second peak, 25 milliseconds average latency, right? So who knows what the distribution was, but we know that it was certainly worse in the 95% case than 25 milliseconds. So where do we get to? Well, we did pretty good. We made the system 20 times faster in terms of throughput. We got our latency all the way down to less than 10 milliseconds. When the system was running at 1,500 requests per second. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Right? Because it'd be very easy to look at the system and go, oh yeah, the peak throughput is 1,700 requests per second. That's the regime we live in. But it's not. We can't let the system get driven that hard because if we do, our latency requirements would have slipped. Right? They needed us to be under 10 milliseconds. You can't drive the system all the way to peak capacity and still meet 10 milliseconds 99% of the time. They were thrilled. We got, we got to, I mean, this is, we got to where they wanted to be in two years over the course of this month. That, uh, part of that is an artifact of the system. I mean, there's, there's nothing that says that just because you follow this process, you will receive the same results. But I still think it's interesting to share with this crowd because if nothing else, it's a great existence proof for, for people. You know, can you build fast web-based systems with closure? Hell yeah, these numbers are awesome. This is one machine. Right, remember I said that we couldn't test on, a, on our production load balance environment. Weird story, I won't even go into it, right? <laughs> Not worth it. We, we do, we did, one of, our, one of our explicit assumptions was that our load balanced um, performance would be, that we would scale close to linearly. We have good reason to believe that's true, right? Again, it was an assumption and we were explicit about that. It's important to do that. But uh, we think that uh, with two systems, right, the sort of minimum you want just for uh, availability, that we can get to 3,000 requests a second and still maintain 10 millisecond um, response time at 1,500 requests per second. Or, sorry, at 99% uh, confidence. Okay. So this is great. Um, of course, a funny thing happened on the way to the you know, end line, the goal line. Actually, lots of funny things happened. And Stuart and I got to work on this a lot together. Um, one of the fun things that happened was that as we uh, did a couple rounds and took out the easy stuff, which was the database, Right? Once we were caching the database, uh, this is a case where you know you got to measure, you got to use the data. The thing we found that was that was dominating um, uh, the the single request response time was logging. Right? We were using syslog through syslog for J, and that was something like 80% of our time in any given request was spent in logging. Okay. Totally unexpected. Right? We had one guy on the team who was like, nah, it's got to be this closure thing, you know, or, or I don't even remember what it was, but it was some, something that totally was not logging. So did our analysis, and wow, that's it. And over the course of a weekend, uh, Stuart, Sierra, and Aaron Bedra, who's also here, um, wrote a, a very thin C wrapper around um, the syslog API call, wrote a, a Java layer on top of that, and we were able to invoke it from closure. And I want to say that something like quadrupled the performance of the system is amazing, right? And I, I think that was, that was a clear demonstration of the benefit of this loop, right? Of being very deliberate at each step. Saying, okay, it's, we're going to be scientific, right? Let's do our analysis. Let's look at data. Oh, yeah, that's it. And just applying just a little bit of that platform, uh, low-level platform code. It's literally 10 lines of C. Boom. Suddenly, we were way back up there. Now, the, one of the interesting consequences of that was, once, the, once we unblocked ourselves and we were able to get to those higher levels of throughput, we were generating an enormous amount of log data. Huge. Two gigabytes an hour. Is that right? Something like that? Uh, the client initially wanted us to keep all of that. We were like, where? <laughs> Dropbox. Dropbox, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we have to like allocate a new free account, right? Just to get <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, so you know we played around with a bunch of stuff. One of the things that we tried was uh, using the syslog forwarding mechanism. You know, so you can send syslog messages across the network. Uh, 
At which point we discovered that for what the version of syslog that we were using, which was dictated to us by the client's infrastructure, um, it was dropping 90% of the messages. <laughs> which I suppose is one way to store that much data. <laughs> also good throughput. Yeah, good throughput, yeah. Um, the other interesting thing that we found, we resolved that problem eventually, that's another story. You can catch me afterwards if you want to hear a little bit about that. But one of the other things we found was that um, uh, we had set up automated load testing. So every night, you know, in the middle of the night, a uh, system would run the load test, which we had scripted through JMeter, and it would email us every morning, results of the test. Well, one day we saw that our peak throughput was down, like a half, something ridiculous. Um, like, whoa, what happened? And we eventually tracked it down to a one character change in a config file. If you put a minus at the beginning of a, a syslog config file for the version of syslog that we were using, it means log asynchronously, which was fine for us. Someone had taken that out. <laughs> Boom. Right? So that was a huge value to us. In the, that's the start early thing, right? You want to you wanna get this stuff automated because it tells you things that have nothing to do with absolute performance and meeting your goals. It tells you there's been a change, right? And we could easily have gotten to production with that and not reap the benefits of the... the and and this, this system really could benefit from every uh, drop of performance we could squeeze out of it. Um, I mentioned the fact that we never um, uh, tested load balance. And one of the other cool side effects of this was uh, by automating our load test, we got a stress test for free, right? We're, we're drawing that throughput curve. Oh, look, here's the peak capacity of our system. When we're doing this, we're driving it as hard as it can keep up with. Well, we've got a test already that drives it that hard. Let's just run it for longer. So every weekend, we would run it over the weekend. And uh, we spent weeks and weeks doing that because we found out that the system had problems over the long run. Nothing to do with closure. There were other th factors there. Um, but that was great, right? That was a nice side effect of all this. So uh, this was a really good experience for us. I mean, uh, worked out great for the customer, and we got lots of nice benefits out of it, too. So what, what do I want you to take away from this is it could really be summed up as when you're doing performance engineering, be deliberate. Right? Think about your model. Say what it is. Make sure it's stochastic. Because the world is stochastic. But at the same time, recognize that your model is wrong. Right? That it deviates from the real world. If you do need to make changes to address uh, the performance of your system, I would suggest you, you use this loop. Right? Measure, adjust, measure again. Right? That's essentially what we're talking about. And we had, uh, we had very good luck with that. Um, so be deliberate. Really, that's the message, right? Well, everyone's still awake, I think. So I appreciate that. Um, thanks. Thank you.